there. Welcome to my video recording of a Nautitech Open 46. My wife and I have been searching for a cruising catamaran over the course of the last year and a half or so. Um, we pretty much started off our real serious review um, when we went to the uh, International Multi Hull Boat Show in La Grande Motte, France, um, a year ago this past April. Uh, this is where we first had the opportunity to see the Nautitech Open 46, and the pictures that you're seeing here are of a test sail that we took on hull number one. This was a boat that uh, really seemed to fit a sweet spot for us, and we decided that uh, to make a decision, we wanted to charter one. So the only boat that we could find that was in charter, that was in the Open 46 configuration, was out of Croatia. So this past May, we traveled uh, to Croatia and we did a seven day charter with uh, six of our friends on the Open 46. And the video you're seeing here is of that charter. This video is really going to be uh, intended for people that are very serious about the Open 46. Uh, it's quite long, apologize for that. Uh, we're going to start off by doing a close examination of some of the uh, components of the boat and then uh, there'll be a section where I do uh, a series of video com commentary about the boat and about what we felt worked well and what didn't work well. And then I'll finish up the video with uh, some of my insights as a result of the seven days that we spent on the boat. First of all, I have to say it was a wonderful trip. We really enjoyed ourselves. Cro Croatia is a wonderful place. If you want to sail, I can't recommend a, a better place. Very friendly people uh, and the waters and the islands that we visited were absolutely stunning. So I hope you enjoy this, this video. I apologize for the length, but in order to get all the content in, it is what it is. So enjoy, and we'll see you at the end. Okay, we're here in the port engine room. Take a little tour. Uh, we've got the larger uh, Volvo engines in this boat, which I think are the uh, 50 horsepower. And uh, the engines are facing aft, with the sail drives forward. Uh, the bulkhead right here is the berth. So the engines are slightly under the berth uh, in the aft staterooms. Engine access is absolutely fantastic. Uh, easy to get to the strainers, alternator water pumps, oil filters, oil fill, it's all good, engine exhaust. Uh, over here we've got the port hydronic Wabasco heater, I think that's a Wabasco, good check. So that's the combustion unit and heat exchange. Looks like there's a shutoff valve. Looks like this has been exposed a little bit to uh, some seawater. Uh, you've got the helm station is directly above. And in fact, the mounts for the seat are there. You've got the control cable for the steering. This is not a, a Jaffa steering system. It's, uh, I'm not sure who makes the rudders or the steering system. There's the hydraulic ram, rudder position indicator for the uh, autopilot. There's the pump unit, it's a Garmin. Uh, that's the NEMA network there. Uh, so on this boat, 
the linkage between the two rudders is cable only so there's no rigid connector between the two rudders. It goes up to a pulley uh, and then through to a rod. The rod goes through a tube which goes through the uh, beam in the aft compartment. This guy right here is a little sump in the cockpit. Take a tour of the uh, starboard side engine compartment as well. Here's an overview of the opening to uh, the main engine room. It's very easy to get in and out. I noticed that the hatches um, do have sealers here, but they're not entirely water watertight. In fact, in the starboard side, there's water in the engine compartment, which was there uh, because the boat was washed down before we left. The hatch uh, closed on the port side engine compartment. Uh, notice the access plate for the emergency rudder. Uh, one thing I notice is the hatches hatch covers have got a little bit of give on them, but are okay. Here's an excess port uh, in the port engine compartment uh, for coolant fill, which is nice. You don't need to open uh, the engine room compartment to get to the uh, coolant or to check it. Starboard side engine compartment. Pretty much the same setup as port, uh, with a couple of exceptions. One is uh, the generator is located here on the starboard side. In this case, it's a self-contained uh, 3.5 kilowatt generator uh, with all the control lines, fuel, exhaust, raw water strainers, uh, similar heat exchanger for the heating system is here uh, and there is no autopilot on this side otherwise it's almost exactly the same setup here on the starboard side scoop is a boarding ladder which is permanently mounted. Also on the stern is the uh, shower, stern shower. A detail on the stern rail setup. Here you have the, uh, the main sheet, car control lines, port starboard, and the main sheet to uh, manual winch on the starboard side. You can see the uh, davits. All right, this is the fuel tank below the sole in the aft porthole. Okay, this makes absolutely no sense to me. Maybe somebody can figure this out. This is the aft bilge opening in the aft stateroom on the porthole. I opened this up. Plenty of storage in here, which is very nice few of them. But when I open this up, we have the, it's cold outside, and we have the uh, heaters running. And when I open this up, the temperature of the bilge was probably 85 degrees. The sole 
in the cabin is warm to the touch. Here's a heat exchanger. Hopefully you can see that. In the bilge, I have no idea why that heat exchanger would be in the bilge. I would expect that heat exchanger to be somewhere in the cabin itself um, in the furniture somewhere or that there would be an opening in the uh, in the bilge cover for warm air to rise so I, I have no idea why they would put a heat exchanger in the bilge okay this is the uh, bilge in between the fore and aft cabins in the port hall. A couple things, uh, here's the water pump, the fresh water system. You see the continuation of the heating lines here. Uh, wiring runs are here. Uh, get the light on there. You can see the forward bilge of, um, in the forward cabin. A nice deep sump. Very nice deep sump. That sump is formed in the keel. I saw that. And then the keel is bonded to the hull. Uh, a lot of uh, catamarans do not have as deep a sump. Here is the sump for the uh, head sink drains and the showers. It's a nice self enclosed. Uh, sump with a uh, pump on the side of it. Here, for, uh, after this bulkhead, you see the uh, Garmin. Uh, that's that's probably the gyro of the compass. And the continuation of the lines. It's well organized, clean can get in there and also there's just a ton of storage here discussion uh, about the helm locations on the Nautitec Open 46 and the helm locations are similar on other boats as well uh, like as an example the Katanas. Katanas have the twin uh, stern helm positions and on this charter one of the key things that we wanted to evaluate was the location of the of these helm stations relative to running the boat. So relative to visibility, under power, under sail, uh, the ability to monitor the sail trim, the ability to run all the running rigging uh, from this position. Uh, one of the other boats that we're considering have the uh, bulkhead, raised bulkhead, single steering pos positions, which you find on the Fontaine Peugeot's, Lagoons, uh, and and leopards. Uh, we were a little concerned about where the helm station uh, was on this boat, uh, whether uh, we would feel uh, that the visibility wasn't uh, good enough and to be comfortable uh, uh, both under power and under sail. So this is our third day of the charter uh, and uh, we've actually been able to maneuver in marinas, we've been able to sail uh, and at this point, I am very comfortable uh, with the location of uh, the helm. Uh, in a second here, we'll actually show you the perspective of the uh, view from the, the helm station. A couple of things, uh, the pros that I really like about this are, one, 
you, the visibility is um, actually in some ways even better than the bulkhead stations. And the reason why is that with the head sail out, you're actually, your eyes are just above deck level and you're looking through the cabin underneath the he head sail. There is maybe a 10 degree area, um, you know, de dead ahead to t 10 degrees to leeward or 10, 10 degrees to the other side of the boat where you have a blind spot. Uh, but that is very easy to, to get around, either by looking around the blind spot or by just uh, uh, heading downwind, uh, maybe an additional 10 degrees to take a look and then heading back back up. I can also stand and look right there and see exactly what I see from this side here. So from a visibility standpoint, uh, that was the only issue that we were co concerned about. The, the location is wonderful for a couple of reasons. One is, you're right in uh, the mix of uh, people that are in the cockpit and in the cabin. The walk from one helm station to the other involves no steps. You walk straight across to the other station. Uh, very short walk, very easy to get over here. The running rigging setup is all right here. Uh, we've got the, uh, the reefing control lines, uh, spinnaker halyard right here. On this side, we've got the main sheet, uh, the, car, the main car control lines, and over here we've got reefing lines, uh, the halyard for the main, and the, uh, the self-tacking jib sheet. So this is right within reach. It's very easy to be steering the boat, and then to trim, raise sails from right here. I can see the sails, I can see the boom front to back. I can see the head sail, I can see the trim on the head sail from right here. Uh, so overall, again, everything's a compromise, regardless of where the helm station is. Uh, and there are pro pros and cons. And so for us, I think the pros of having the twin stations here outweigh uh, the cons. Uh, the only uh, issue that I see is the exposure element of this helm. We had uh, uh, a day where we sailed in quite a bit of rain and uh, yeah you get wet there's no no question about it you're definitely out here in the weather. I could see uh, an opportunity to, to take a look at a bimini setup where you could have side panels uh, including uh, uh, like a dodger type of setup uh, uh, you know, in a situation where you're going to have, you're going to be in weather, uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, the boat is pretty much running under autopilot. Uh, you can pull up your iPhone and adjust the autopilot from your iPhone. Uh, you can sit in the main cabin when conditions get really bad, bad, and helm from there. Uh, so, you know, the amount of time that you're actually sitting here at the helm station steering. Uh, is uh, not that great unless you really enjoy it. Uh, the other aspect is that typically one uh, position, either port or starboard, is going to be in the shade. And so if you want shade, you can go down to, uh, uh, it's going to be typically the leeward station, you can go down to the, the leeward station uh, and have shade. So um, again, uh, for, for me, I think the question is answered. Uh, the pros of the twin helm stations here on the transom uh, outweigh uh, the cons. Let's talk about the uh, the davits, uh, the davit setup on the boat. Um, first of all, they're very uh, sturdy. I mean, it's a very heavy duty davits. I've seen other davit systems on other boats which are not nearly as as uh, well constructed and thought out as these. Uh, you got two lines on each side. Uh, either line can be led to the main halyard winch uh, right here. Uh, I could see uh, a setup to where you can rig this as a single line. Uh, I think that that would work out okay. Uh, also the main, the main sheet and the car control lines which are currently only on the starboard side can also be led to the port side. 
Uh, it's set up. They've got the pads ready to go uh, to uh, have the control lines and the main sheet uh, on both port and starboard. Uh, in which case you could run one line to a winch on the starboard side and one line to a winch on the, on the port side. But we raised and lowered this dinghy yesterday and it was very simple and straightforward. On this boat, uh, they have an outboard bracket uh, right on the, the push pit here. <coughs> and uh, it's a little awkward uh, to get the motor off and on the boat if this was my boat. I would probably keep the motor on the dinghy uh, and do a different setup uh, on uh, on the on the hoisting of the dinghy, so I'd strengthen that, and uh, or I would in, uh, install an in, uh, engine winch uh, crane uh, to raise it and uh, and and, uh, and lower it. So, but otherwise, I think it's really well set up. <clears throat> on some so some boats now, like the, uh, the Leopards, and I think on uh, some of the Katana boats, they've gone to a system where it's a rigid frame uh, that's hinged right here on the beam, on this beam here, on the stern. And there's a crane up here, uh, which brings the frame up. Uh, the advantage to, to that is it gets the dinghy higher. Now what I've, I found, uh, we sailed uh, yesterday in some pretty uh, decent seas and we had some uh, slapping of water on the bottom of the, the dinghy, so I think the dinghy could be a little bit higher. I think if you work out a slightly different bridle setup on this boat, you would be able to get it up a little bit higher, which would be good. Also you have the potential uh, with the davits the way these guys are to install um, small little uh, pad eyes fore and aft and you can lash uh, like stand up paddle boards across here or even a kayak. Uh, I've seen uh, some of the owners uh, install brackets on the davits for, uh, for solar panels. Uh, the main the main sheet is way up here, uh, along with the car, and so you, you don't have to worry about snagging it uh, with a main sheet. If you did have the solar panels out there, I think it would work out just fine. Um, okay, the cockpit. So we have this charter uh, with nine people, including uh, a paid skipper, which is showing us around Croatia. Really, I think, Having the skipper was really one of the best things that we decided to do. Uh, he's been really helpful to us and he's been helping us in terms of getting used to handling a boat this size, uh, and giving us some pointers and showing us how to mid tie and doing all of that. But we have nine people on this boat that we've been uh, sleeping and eating together for the last three days. Uh, the cockpit is absolutely wonderful on this boat. You can easily sit nine people in the cockpit, socialize and eat. Uh, there's two removable stools from, uh, from the main cabin that you can bring out here and use for seating as well. I could see you carrying some folding chairs to put around here. Uh, this table happens to be a high-low table and there is a cushion uh, that fits on top of the table if you want to use this as an outside berth. One of the great things I love about this cockpit is the ability to uh, lower uh, either a sun shade, which is already up here, or an enclosure. Um, the encl it's very, very sim simple to lower these and to tie them down. There's a complete cockpit enclosure on this boat. Uh, at one point we had all three sides down. It was uh, pretty windy and rainy. So we closed them and we were able to sit and enjoy the cockpit. Uh, it's one of the great, great features of the boat. The lighting is well done. Uh, these strips in between the panels here are lighting strips and it pro provides a real nice glow to the cockpit. Um, here's the actually the switch for those lights. There's a switch right, right there. So if you're boarding the boat at night, you just hit that little switch by the port helm station 
and that will turn the lights on. There's a uh, uh, room here for uh, an outdoor fridge for drinks. Very well thought out. Uh, the cap, the main cabin light switch is is right here, so you can turn turn those on from here as you're entering the boat. Uh, here is uh, an area uh, that that can drain where you can put uh, you can put ice and fish. You can clean a fish here, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, or if you've got wet clothes or whatever, you can set them up here and it will drain. There's a nice drain there. And just overall, the, the cockpit works really, really well. I'm very pleased. You've got a lot of shelf space on both sides uh, where you can, you know, put, uh, put clothes or whatever you want to put in those areas. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great, great feature of the boat. And that's why I guess they call it an open 46. Okay, the doors uh, work well. Uh, so there's two two doors for slide. These are uh, bottom sliding doors. So I think you're going to have to make sure that the tracks stay clean, uh, so the doors will continue to slide. Uh, they latch, so when it, it, it closes, it latches and it stays closed. Uh, little uh, little bit of an issue I see. Uh, there's an interior trim piece on the inside, which this door seems to be hitting. You can kind of hear it hit there. That's a really simple thing to fix. Uh, when the doors are closed, they latch uh, with a lock. To open, you push down. Uh, apparently, somebody has walked in this in the past, and <laughs> so the charter kit company has put some tape up here. Uh, to make sure that people know that the door is closed and they don't walk into it. Uh, but overall, um, you know, I, th I think that they work extremely well. Very easy to open, very easy to close. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the running rigging on the boat and uh, how uh, the foredeck is set up and how we've been using it. Uh, a couple things. One is this handhold here works pr pretty well. Uh, it runs almost the full length of uh, the cabin top uh, and uh, I notice that everyone is using it when we're underway going fore and aft. A couple things about the running rigging that uh, are a little worrisome are the number of turns uh, that the lines use. So for example this is the main halyard here the main halyard comes is a two to one on the main, comes down the mast, makes a 90 degree turn, another 90 degree turn, goes aft to a turning block here, exits down in the cockpit, and then makes a 90 degree turn again. So a total of four turns. So if you look at that, you'll see that. Now, what, what, I what we, we have found, uh, yesterday, for example, we had about 28 knots of true wind. We were sailing downwind with a full main. Uh, and when it came time to drop the main, we had to turn up into the wind to drop the main. And uh, in that much wind, with that much sail up, it was difficult to get that main down. Uh, our skipper had to go up on the cabin top and wrestle the sail down. And I think the key, the key reason for that is the fact that the cars are not ball bearing cars, they're just simple sliders on a track. Uh, I think that this boat would significantly benefit from ball bearing cars uh, and would really help to get that sail down uh, in those kinds of con conditions. But even in lighter air, we had a reef in the first day to drop the sail, it was the same story. We had to go up to, to the mast to, to, uh, to, get, to get the sail down. So um, I think one of the, th if I were to order this boat, one of the key things that I would do is I'd change the setup on the, on the main cars. The, the foredeck on, on the boat, the nets, uh, and the whole setup on the foredeck 
uh, I think works really well. It's worked well for us over the course of the last few days. Uh, access to the windlass, uh, the chain, and the anchor. Uh, the, this area here with these cushions have been extremely comfortable to lie out on, and uh, many of our party have been out here, uh, even in fairly rough conditions. We haven't had, haven't seen any water come across the bow yet. Uh, so, um, uh, but in terms of uh, weather like we have today, this is a great place to hang out. One of the key concerns that I have that I would probably change or try to, to make a modification to is access to, to the cabin top. So we've got these two steps here, and I'll kind of show you when you go up these steps, literally the top of the self-tacking jib sheet here and use that to help to steady myself, but that's really probably not a good idea. So as you're going up these steps, which are pretty big steps, there's nothing to hold on to. So I could see uh, having a nice handle on this mass that you could grab right here, hold on to. I've been gr grabbing uh, the shrouds on either side to support myself as I go up here. Um, one of the, the concerns that I've got is, this is uh, the spinner halyard here, is I'd like, if possible, to have uh, two spinnaker halyards. Uh, I'd like to be able to hoist uh, the spinnakers from right here as opposed to running the halyards aft. That way, if I'm going to ho hoist the spinnaker myself, uh, I could do it right here. So I'm not quite sure how I'm going to set that up, whether uh, we'll put uh, a, a winch right on the mast, um, and uh, that way at least I've got the opportunity to be able to hoist it myself from here. Uh, another thing about the setup that I really like is the height of the boom. There is absolutely no issue with getting access to the main, uh, to opening the bag up, flaking the sail. It's very, very easy to come up here. Got great access here. So it's, it's uh, you know, on many of the cats that I've seen, uh, the booms are way high, and it's very difficult to get access to the main or to the stack pack. Uh, so that's one, one thing I really like. The other thing I really like is you look at the amount of space up here, you have tremendous opportunity for solar panels. So there's just a ton of space up here. Uh, we, we mapped it out, and you can easily get uh, six uh, 125 or 150 watt panels up here, uh, which is fantastic without needing to put the solar panel rack on the davits. Um, you feel nice and secure up here. Uh, the only thing is um, the skylights for the main cabin can be slippery when wet. So I think what you probably want to do is put some non-skid strips on these. But otherwise, that works well. This is uh, uh, this is something that is um, I've only seen this on the Nautitex, and I'm not too sure about it. But this is actually the jib halyard for the working jib, and so apparently there's a pulley here. So apparently they tension this uh, on this track. Uh, I'm not, I guess what they do is uh, they, they take a line uh, through a pulley and a winch and t tension it and then lock it in. Uh, and I guess this is de designed so that you can release this under pressure. Uh, it's an uh, Antel, made in Italy system, A-N-T-A-L, if you want to get a shot of the side of that wing. Self-tacking uh, jib, so it's a it's about a 90% jib. Uh, the car is pretty beefy, and it's got stops on it that slide well. 
Um, my issues with this, and I've had other boats with self-tackers, uh, is that off the wind, it's really hard to uh, trim the sail to draw right. The track just isn't long enough. Uh, yesterday, as an example, uh, we sailed down from Pula. Uh, it's some pretty strong winds. We were keeping the boat at about 140 degrees apparent. And we could get the sail drawing, you know, right in the middle or right at the top or right at the foot, but we couldn't get the whole sail drawing right. So we just didn't have the right sheeting angle or the sail just isn't cut right. Uh, but the other thing about it is that going dead downwind, uh, this car will have a tendency to really slap around up here. Uh, and that's where the stops would come into play. You notice the car is set up for control lines. And so potentially you could rig control lines and run those back into the cockpit. All right, let's uh, take a tour of the main cabin and talk about some of the uh, options available on the Nautitech Open 46 and some of the things that I like and dislike about, about this. Uh, so first of all, this boat has got the refrigerators here on the port side uh, of the entrance from the cockpit. Uh, there is an option to get this as a true nav station where the, uh, the height of this is lower and uh, you, you could actually uh, have a permanent seat mounted, not from the factory, but uh, after market. If you look at the uh, Utamir, uh, uh, the, the, the helm state or the, the, nav, the nav stations on the Utamirs, uh, they have a mounted swivel uh, mesh seat, which would be very nice. I could see you sitting here having the view of the boat, having your instruments here, including maybe an MFD uh, and the autopilot and controlling the boat from right here. Uh, easy access to the cockpit and the helm stations and the running rigging. So this would be a very nice location for a nav station. And again, that is available as a factory option. Now on the starboard side opposite this uh, is a lounge. Um, there are two s movable stools which can be used as seats either in the cockpit or for the uh, main cabin table. Uh, the lounge. So <coughs> the, overall the cabin is probably smaller than you would expect to see like on a Fontaine Peugeot 44 or a, a Lagoon 45 uh, because I think they've given you more uh, room in the cockpit. Uh, in addition, I think that the cabin itself is a little bit further aft on this boat than some of the other cat catamarans that we've looked at. Um, and so the lounge is nice for seating, um, especially when you have nine people. Uh, but for us, I think uh, we would go with the factory option of a cabinet. The cabinet comes right off of here and it goes out to about here, and it's countertop height. Uh, there is a TV compartment in the back with a lifting shelf to raise the TV here, which is in a great spot for it. A lot of storage. And then the refrigerator unit, refrigerator freezer unit, which you see over here now, is mounted on this side of the cabinets. So for us, I think uh, if we were to order an open 46, we would take it with the nav station on the port side and then the cabinet here on the starboard side with the refrigerators. Um, so that's the first option. A couple things about the main cabin. <clears throat> um, this boat has got this high-low table, uh, which has got two folding leaves. The leaves come out like this. And this table can actually turn. Um, it's a little strange the way that they've done this. I think that you could do a better job in terms of a folding table uh, by maybe having you know, four triangular leaves that I've seen on other boats. 
uh, in, in which would give you a larger table because right now there's a gap here so if you're sitting on this side you're kind of far away from the table itself if you're over here you're you're good this this is good so it's a little weird from a size standpoint the other uh, thing about this is that the high low pedestal that you see down here is manual uh, so you have to open the clamps push the table down or pull it up uh, I've seen setups on other Bavarias actually that have a hydraulic pedestal where you could just press a button and lower the table down I've, they also have the option where you take those two cushions and they put the cushions here as kind of a uh, a coffee table with a little tray on top uh, that is I think a way a lot of owners get it I really prefer having a nice cabin table I think from a seating standpoint uh, you can actually get you know one two three four you could you could get five people around this with another one at that end so six I think that th this would actually seat six people it's convenient to the galley um, and so for me I would probably get just a, <clears throat> a a factory basic table or not even get a table and after market I would have a table built with the four triangular leaves and a hydraulic pedestal that would go up and down because uh, right now the way this table is set up is just a little a little weird other than the helm stations the biggest question mark that my wife and I have had about the open 46 is the galley setup not only the location of the galley which is different than most catamarans that we've looked at uh, the lo location is obviously forward most of the galley setups are in one or the other aft corners uh, so we weren't sure about this um, we felt like it compromised the dinette seating a little bit too much um, and um, but after using this galley to cook for nine people over the course of the last three days uh, we're actually finding it to be a lot more usable than we thought however there are a couple things about this that um, would probably drive me crazy uh, that we would need to address uh, the first is the countertops. Uh, the way that Nautitech has built this is a little strange. They've got this piece of wood trim and they've got this countertop material which is, I don't know how many centimeters that is, um, and then this is caulked against the wood. So you've got some caulking here which is going to get dirty and ugly. Uh, you've got caulking here, which is going to get dirty and ugly. You've got, you've got a, a ledge here, which is going to collect dirt and be difficult to clean. We've actually found there's a cover that goes in here. Let me put it in. Here's the cover that goes in there. We've actually found that somebody will walk by and accidentally turn the water on. You've got the fr fresh water here. Here's a, a pumped seawater. Uh, that we, we've turned this on and basically flooded this um, and it's just and you can see here here's like a, a coffee stain right here I think uh, that has stained the, the material so it's not great uh, we I think what we would look to do is to potentially uh, just take a different countertop material and bed it right on top of this material uh, just go right over the top of this, overhang the wood uh, with a small lip around the outside. Uh, I think that that would be much more practical, would wear m much better. I could just see this countertop getting uh, abused very quickly and showing wear and tear. <laughs> a couple other aspects of the galley. The Nautitech provided stove and oven are pretty bad. Um, it's a what is that E and O uh, stovetop, and I don't know what the oven is. So it's also an E and O oven. Uh, there's no temperature control on the oven. There's no thermometer on the oven. 
It's a very small stove. Uh, we, we found coming down from Pula uh, uh, yesterday in pretty nasty conditions. We had a, a cross swell. Uh, uh, one of our par party members were frying eggs up here and the frying pan started sliding. Uh, fortunately, she was able to catch it by the handle and not burn herself, but that was uh, a scary moment. <clears throat> so you definitely would want to have um, uh, stove clamps on here to be able to tie your pots and pans down. But it's a, pr a very small burner. Notice, like, there's there's not a huge amount of countertop space here. Uh, so it's a it's a fairly small galley. Uh, you know, yeah, I think you can basically have two people cooking at once. You got some counter space here. Uh, the cabinets themselves are nice. Uh, you look at some of the thoughts, like here's the trash here. Uh, you've got a recycle uh, trash drawer and a trash drawer. Uh, these are all soft clothes. Uh, you've got some thought put into storage with drawers inside of drawers, which is nice. Uh, all of the woodwork on the boat all the furniture is manufactured by Bavaria for not Nautitech. They manufacture this in Germany at their huge, huge plant. Uh, everything is, you know, computer controlled, cut. Um, the furniture is on the boat is pretty heavy. There's no composite material. It's either plywood or solid. Uh, I talked to a factory rep who told me that uh, if they were to use composite materials that it would probably save about 800 kilograms of weight on the boat and that they were evaluating that and potentially at some point in the future uh, they would switch over to a composite material which would be much lighter in weight but it's very durable sturdy stuff. Uh, the other aspect of the galley that really bothers me is one at night there's no down lighting on the counter. We have the same lighting that we have in, in the cockpit. So we've got this ceiling uh, LED lighting with no focused lights. Uh, Wayne's going to turn that on so you can see see that. It, it lights the, uh, uh, the cabin very nicely. It would be nice to be able to dim that. There's no dimmer on that. Uh, that would be something that I would definitely want to do to be able to dim that because it's pretty bright and there's it's either off or on um, and then the countertops are dark so you definitely need some down lighting now there's this trim piece here where you can see the clock uh, and there's plenty of room behind the trim piece where you could put uh, some focused LED lighting on the counters but the other aspect to the galley layout that I don't like is this. So I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm 6'1", and when I want to work on this counter, I'm hitting my head on this. Mm -hmm. Now, for my wife, which is only this tall, it's no problem. But for me, that's a problem. <laughs> so that's one thing about the galley that I'm not very happy with. Um, there's no option. The galley, this is where the galley goes. And so it's one of the compromises we would have to make. Uh, this here is a uh, refrigerator. I don't know if this can be a, a freezer as well. I thought I'd turn that off. Uh, so it's a small little day uh, re reefer that you can use. Um, <clears throat> there's no... Uh, real great place for a microwave. You could potentially put a microwave here. Uh, there is an outlet here. Um, on this particular boat, uh, this being a charter boat, I think that they've done some of the minimum uh, electrical options on the boat. Uh, there's only one outlet in the entire boat, one AC outlet in the entire boat, which is running off of the inverter, and that's the one over here at the nav station. Uh, you can see we've got a charger there to charge a bunch of iPhones and iPads, but that is the only outlet in the entire, uh, the only AC outlet in the entire boat, which is powered off the inverter. So unless you've got the generator running, 
uh, you're out of luck in terms of using any of the outlets. So we wanted to run a microwave or um, a coffee maker uh, off of that outlet there, we'd be out of luck because it's not hooked up to the inverter. <clears throat> Putting uh, food up here on the counters, I think all that is fine, it works. There's plenty of storage where we could, could put it. But for us, uh, you know, we're only on the boat for seven days. Uh, it's fine to put put all this stuff here. Having a microwave there uh, would, you know, would p potentially uh, impair your, your visibility. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. All right, let's let's talk about some of the uh, uh, electrical systems on the boat. Um, and so, first of all, here on the forward side, if Wayne, if you could switch the camera, you're going to see a heat exchanger here uh, with a little off on switch. And then up here, you're going to see a thermostat. Uh, this boat is equipped uh, with a, um, I forget what, what they call it, it's a hot, it's a hot water uh, heating system. Uh, there's a, a diesel fired uh, uh, heat exchanger in both port and starboard hulls. So there are two switches here uh, to turn the heating on. When the heating is on, uh, there are control zones like this little switch right here, uh, which operate this heat exchanger here. There's another one on the other side of the main cabin. And then each one of the four cabins in this boat is a charter version of the boat. So there's four double cabins on this boat. It's not an owner's version. Each cabin has got a thermostat like that and an off on switch for um, to uh, to enable the he the heating or not. Uh, in, the, in the case of the main cabin, the main cabin is heated through these heat exchangers. The um, staterooms, the four uh, staterooms, are heated through radiant heating through that hot water system. And the floors, uh, the sole, cabin sole, in those staterooms get warm. It's a little strange uh, from a heating system standpoint. I would much rather see similar type heat exchangers in the cabins. The other aspect about the heating on this boat is that the heads and showers are not he heated. So you can have a nice cozy stateroom and when you go into the head or the shower it will be really cold. So um, that's one of the things I don't like. Boat seems to heat up pretty quickly in the morning. Like this morning I was up at uh, I think 5.30. Uh, we were at anchor. It was chilly. I turned the heating systems on and the main cabin was pretty toasty in about 30 minutes. Uh, in terms of uh, the staterooms though, it takes the staterooms a lot longer to warm up because of this strange radiant heating they have in the floor. Uh, again, I think that a heat exchanger in the cabins and in the heads would be a much better idea. Uh, the other thing that I, I understand is that uh, this particular heating system uh, which draws very little amperage and burns a small amount of fuel uh, to heat up the liquid in the heating system uh, is uh, very energy efficient. So we've been running it at night on batteries without any issues. Uh, so from that standpoint it's good. I also understand that uh, during summer you can actually enable a heat exchanger uh, with seawater. So the liquid in the system would uh, cool, be cooled by the temperature of the seawater through that seawater exchanger and you would activate the, um, uh, the radiators uh, which would then uh, cool uh, the boat down to whatever the temperature of the seawater was. If you're in an area with 80 degrees seawater then it's going to be an issue. But um, from a cooling uh, standpoint, uh, if you're in a colder water area, could potentially be good. Let's talk about the AC panel. <coughs> so the, this is the AC panel. Uh, a couple things about this panel that I like. One is that it's got uh, the tank uh, uh, level indicators for water and fuel, both port and starboard. The boat has got uh, 
two 300 liter water tanks and two 300 liter fuel tanks. Uh, I think that's a, a 300 liters is about 150 gallons or 600 liters is about um, 150 gallons. Um, it has a very rudimentary battery monitor system. Uh, you, uh, in my opinion, you need a much better battery monitoring system, one with alarms. When we uh, came on the boat uh, three days ago, apparently the batteries were not charging and we were already down like almost 400 amp hours on the house bank. I, I don't even know what the capacity of the house bank is. Uh, so that was a pr problem. We had to run the uh, the generator quite a bit on our first day just to get the batteries topped up a little bit because uh, we were doing mostly sailing. We weren't doing a lot of uh, motoring. <clears throat> Panel itself is pretty self-explanatory. It has uh, a diagram of the boat. <laughs> Notice it's kind of interesting. It's not a catamaran that they're showing here, but I guess from a navigational light standpoint, it's the same thing. But if we were to turn on, say, for example, like the steaming light, there's an LED right here, uh, which would tell you that the steaming light is on. Uh, if we were to turn on the anchor light, uh, which if I could find, well, here's the saloon lights, anchor light, steaming light, the nav lights, you can see the nav light indicators on here. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty easy and clear to, to use. There's some additional circuits here which are open and available. And then you've got your main buses uh, from a, a DC standpoint here. On the AC side, the AC side is here. And this locker. Um, and this setup is uh, a little strange. Not 100% sure uh, how everything works here. We had some issues with connecting to shore power. Our skipper had to intervene and kind of play around with the circuit breakers here. So I think it would pay to read the, the manual. I think, uh, you know, what they've done here from an AC st standpoint is a little strange uh, to start and run the generator, for example. Um, the starter is right up here on the nav, nav station. Uh, this boat is equipped with a small generator. I think it's only a 3.5 kilowatt generator. Yeah, it puts out, uh, as best as I can tell, based on the battery mo monitor, about 60 amp hours. Uh, so if you've got, you know, if you need to re uh, recharge 400 amp hours of battery use, it's going to take some time for the alternator to run to, re to charge that up. Um, and apparently the switching is automatic. So if you start the alternator and you're on shore power, as an example, it will automatically switch from shore power to, um, to the power that's being generated from the generator. Uh, I would much prefer to have that not be an automatic setup. I'd much rather have the ability to control it. So I don't know what's available from a factory option standpoint. That's one of the things that I need to investigate is what are the options from um, uh, from an AC standpoint? Um, okay, let's uh, let's go in the, into the head, and uh, we'll talk about the head a little bit. This boat is uh, set up with the four staterooms. It does not have the owner uh, uh, stateroom where you would have a, a much larger shower and uh, and head. Uh, in the forward part of uh, the port hall. <clears throat> in this case, both port and starboard sides are exactly the same. Uh, there are four head compartments that are pretty small. Maybe that's maybe four feet by two and a half feet. Um, they're just big enough to get a sink uh, and a toilet. Um, this boat is equipped with just manual flushing, seawater flush, uh, heads <clears throat> and uh, it has a pretty decent uh, storage locker here. Um, these, this uh, box here, I think, is where the chain plates are, so it's sealed off. Um, uh, but you can get quite a bit of storage in there. Uh, <clears throat> the mirror is a little awkward to use. It's right over the toilet. It's not here. 
uh, over the sink because we've got a portal here. Um, and so if you're going to shave or whatever, it can be pretty dark um, and, and difficult to get to. Like for me, the mirror is too low. I can't see my face fully standing, so I've got it slumped down to see, you know, to shave or do whatever. So it's a little, little strange setup. Uh, there's also storage under, under here. It's where the toilet paper holder is. And, uh, it, you know, but it works. Um, I think uh, from a guest standpoint, it's okay. There is a drain uh, in this compartment and there's a handheld shower for whatever reason. If you wanted to shower in here, you absolutely could. Uh, but for on each side of the hall, there is a dedicated shower, which Wayne is standing in right now. So we'll switch places and we'll show you what the shower is like. All right, so I'm, I'm not 100% uh, sure how much you're actually going to be able to see, but I'm actually in the shower. There is a door that closes between the head and the shower. This is a walkthrough shower. So the other head, the forward head, uh, has a door as well and can access the shower uh, for privacy. There is a little latch here that from your head compartment you can latch. Um, the shower is adequate. I mean, you know, it, it works. I think the biggest uh, 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 knock that I have about the shower setup is really the water system on the boat. Um, so, so first of all, the water pumps are extremely noisy. So if you um, activate a sink, yeah, I don't know if you, if you can hear, hear that. Yeah, in fact, Wayne, Film, film that, you're going to see the water um, is going to fluctuate. The pressure is going to go down and then it's going to go up there. Um, so it's it, the water system on the boat is not great. Uh, noisy pumps, lack of water pressure. The water pressure in this shower is absolutely horrible. Uh, and if you hear that noise, that's the sump pump. So the sink drains, the shower drains, all go into a sump. And it'd be really interesting to see that sump and see what kind of filter system they have on it, whether that is a filter system that's going to get clogged up often or not. Um, but that noise is a very noisy sump pump. But the water pressure again is horrible. Um, the, sh the water pressure in this shower is basically a dribble. I don't know if it's something with the plumbing specific to the shower or not, uh, but it's definitely not great. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, I think for uh, the two uh, staterooms in the non-owner hall, if you order an owner owner version, um, it it would you know it works. Um, let's talk about storage in the in the staterooms. Storage is quite good. Um, they've done a pretty good job on the furniture uh, in terms of giving you access to, to good storage. This is actually um, an access panel for equipment. Let's pull this off so you can see this. So here is uh, your fuses. All your fuses are here. Uh, the wiring is got all is all number coded uh, based on the owner's manual, so you can look up any of these codes to know what these wires do. Uh, here is the shipboard Wi-Fi system here, of which uh, on this particular boat there's a uh, a cell uh, extender, and we uh, as part of our charter agreement we get 50 gigabytes of uh, of uh, of data access during our charter, which is nice. Everyone's been using their iPads and iPhones all on the ship wireless. Uh, so you got your main positive buses, your main negative buses are here, all on the DC side. Uh, I think right here is the NEMA network, because uh, I've seen similar type of wiring runs elsewhere in the boat. 
Let's put this back here. With the uh, storage and the, the stateroom, you've got a nice hanging locker. Uh, that's access. You've got nice uh, shelf on the inside uh, part of the bunk. Uh, you've got actually two shelves. I'm not sure what these guys are. There's no handles on these guys. Uh, I need to get a suction cup to pull those up and see what's down there. Uh, it's probably some wiring runs to give you access. The lighting in here is great. Uh, let me turn the lighting on. You'll see the same type of lighting in the main cabin, in the staterooms as in the main cabin. You've got re reading lights. Uh, this boat has got fans uh, in the the, the staterooms, which work well. From a ventilation standpoint, there's a small portal here, which by, by the way, we had uh, one night where it poured the entire night and we had some leakage uh, on that portal. Uh, we have a small overhead right above your head, Wayne. Right here. So the ventilation is okay. It's not great, but it'll work. Again, uh, a lighting de detail, which is nice. There's lighting in the hallway. They use the same lighting strips as they do in the main cabin. Let's see if anyone's in here. Let's take a look at the forward cabin. Uh, the berths all have large uh, pull-out drawers underneath them. We can two here. Big drawer. We actually put our our suitcases in ours. Then you've got uh, the hanging. You've got a, a lot a locker space here in the forward cabin. Uh, the bunks are a little bit narrower, but not bad. Nice deep shelves. Uh, again, you can see the thermostat uh, with the on-off switch for the heating system. Uh, let's see over here should be a hanging locker. Yep, nice. That's a that's a big ha hanging locker. So a lot of storage here, and then you've got all oh, these ca cabinets here. So yeah, you're right. There's a lot of storage space in the forward cabin here, and behind the door, there's a lot of storage here. So a lot of storage in the, in the cabins. The head here is pretty much a mirror image of the one that we just saw, the aft head. And again, here's the shower door that opens up to the same shower. Okay, so just kind of showing some of our, uh, our, our crew here. Uh, sitting around in the cockpit enjoying the day. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. Beautiful little harbor that we're in. Um, we're um, just really enjoying the trip in, in Croatia overall. So let's let's talk about the boat in general. So we've been evaluating catamarans for well over a year. <clears throat> we saw hall number one of the open 46 at the uh, international multi hall show in France a year ago, almost exactly a year ago. <clears throat> and we sailed on hall number one, which is a boat by the name of Binteng. Um, for us, it's, uh, uh, I, we think that the boat is a good compromise between performance uh, and comfort and safety. One of the interesting things uh, in talking to uh, the chartered companies that are actually chartering these boats and I had a conversation with the head technical guy at um, Ocean Yacht Charters on Saturday when we took delivery of this charter boat and I asked him I said you, you charter Fontaine Peugeot's, you charter Leopards, you charter Lagoons tell me about the Nautitech Open 46. He said every single person that sails on the Open 46 is highly impressed with the performance of the boat. Uh, so far from a maintenance standpoint uh, in a charter, uh, it's been excellent. No uh, significant issues. A few leaky portals here and there that they've had to deal with on the Y7 
size of the boat's been really solid. Uh, and in sailing the boat over the course of the last three days, uh, we're beginning to appreciate uh, the ease in which uh, it takes to actually run the boat and to sail the boat. So um, as of right now, this boat seems to be a pretty good choice for us and we'll continue to evaluate it over the course of, the, of this week. And uh, we're evaluating one other boat and we'll see how that goes and uh, then we'll make a decision. Okay, again, I uh, apologize for my crappy mic here, which I now believe is defective, but it's all I've got and I want to get this video up. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just quickly talk about uh, some of my likes and dislikes, must-have changes, and uh, key concerns about the boat. And I actually posted a long series of notes uh, on these topics up to the cruisers form. I'll provide a link here in the description of the video that you can click on and go and read. But let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things I really liked about the boat and some of the things I didn't and some of the things that I definitely have concerns about. So first of all, uh, the helm lo locations, as I indicated earlier, uh, for us, I think the helm uh, uh, really work, the, the helms really work well for us. Um, yeah, there's disadvantages in terms of visibility um, under certain c circumstances. Um, you're in the weather a little bit more than you would be on a bulkhead mounted helm uh, spot. Uh, but for us, um, uh, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the benefits outweigh the negatives associated with them, so it's a good option for us. I uh, really like the way the boat sailed. I thought the boat sailed extremely well, despite the fact that sails were not great and the way the running rigging was set up was not great. Overall, I was pleased with the performance of the boat, the way the boat handled, uh, both under sail and power. Uh, the cockpit for us worked really well. We liked the layout of the cockpit. We liked the ease in which you could uh, lower the uh, enclosure. Um, so overall, it was just a very, very nice feature of the boat. Fore deck on the boat was well set up, very comfortable. Uh, the overall looks of the boat we liked. Um, the scoops uh, on the transoms worked extremely well, getting on and off the, the dinghy, the size of them was good, and just the setup was good. Loved the engine room access, engine room access was fantastic, uh, uh, the access to the engines were great. Um, the bilges and, this, and the, wire, the general wiring in the boat seemed to be uh, good. Uh, access to the boom and mainsail on the cabin top was great and then just in general uh, the access to the decks, the handholds and everything else was good. On the dislike side uh, we thought uh, overall that the winches were undersized uh, particularly on this boat there was one power winch and the power winch really struggled to get that main up. I don't know if it was the result of the uh, car system that they had on the main or whatever, but it was uh, difficult to get enough tension uh, on the left of the main. Uh, the interior lighting uh, on many levels was just poor. The lack of spotlighting over the counters, the lack of ability to really be able to adjust the brightness of the lights. Um, that trim piece over the galley was a pain in the neck for me. Um, the, some of the door hardware um, just seemed to be cheap. Uh, the locations of the bow cleats weren't great. Um, main cabin could definitely use a, a additional opening hatches, particularly over the um, galley area would be great. Uh, main cabin doors uh, um, are difficult to actually operate when the boat is in a rolly seaway. Uh, you got to be very careful uh, in opening that door. It's very heavy. Uh, main halyard and, uh, and the mainsail cars were absolutely horrible. Um, definitely need to be replaced with ball bearing system. Uh, the water systems on the boat just were not great. Um, the boat could really use uh, a thorough going over from a water pressure standpoint, maybe additional water pumps, one in each hull, uh, along with uh, accumulator tanks would be, uh, would be good. 
the uh, the heating system in the in the cabins was underneath the sole. Uh, still don't understand why they would do that. Um, the galley counter was bad; needs to be replaced um, per the video. Um, and I think that uh, I have a list of like 24 items here that I didn't like. Uh, all of those items will be up on the cruiser's form that you can read through. Um, must have cha changes in my opinion. Um, you need to change some of the aspects of the lighting. Uh, it would be great to have the engine controls at both helm stations. <clears throat> um, I know that the electric controls are way better than the, than the uh, mechanical controls. Uh, the dinghy, the height of the dinghy on the davits needs to be addressed with a, with a better system on the bridles. Uh, again, the mainsail cars. The, wa the water system really needs to be addressed. Uh, lack of water pressure. I think uh, the boat could really benefit from having a water pump in each hull and accumulator tanks as well. Um, I would increase uh, some of the sizes of the winches and turn them into power winches. Uh, the cooktop and the oven were uh, were really bad in my opinion and should be replaced with a better better units. Uh, countertop I, I talked about already and I have here a total of 23 items on my dislike list. Uh, you're free to read these on the cruisers form. Again the link is in the description here. Um, let's talk about key concerns on the boat. So overall uh, I felt that uh, whether it's an overall configuration of the hulls and the bridge deck or whether it's the uh, hard chine that the boat has to give you more interior volume, uh, that there was a lot of wave slapping going on. I talk about that in the cruiser's forum. You can, you can read that. I also felt that uh, coming off of large swells and um, having uh, increase in winds, that the boat seemed to overall be working. That there was uh, squeaking going on in some of the bulkheads. You could actually put your hand on the bulkhead and feel the vibration of the movement. Uh, whether that's common, whether that's acceptable or not, I'm not quite sure, but um, just in general, I felt that the boat was working um, in, in larger seas. Overall quality of the boat, um, when you look at things like, you know, hidden wiring and some of this could be aftermarket issues, some of it could be factory issues, but just in general, I thought that from an overall quality standpoint, there, there's room for improvement. Uh, the mainsail, the, the setup on the mainsail uh, from the factory is just not great. And then uh, on the main ground ground tackle, um, we, I felt that um, you know, having a single roller for a single anchor is not, not a great setup, and plus the anchor roller looked like it would be difficult to accommodate uh, different types of anchors such as a mantis or a rockna. Um, so bottom line for us um, going through this charter which by the way was a great experience recommend anyone considering buying a boat to do this uh, we felt that the uh, that the boat is um, not quite for us. So we're uh, going to continue our search. Uh, stay tuned to my channel and uh, we'll have some additional videos of additional boats that we're evaluating uh, over the course of the next few months and stay tuned and thank you very very much for hanging in here in this very very long video. Thanks and sorry again for the mic. No. Who knows? So if you can hear me over the wind noise we're doing six plus knots and 12 knots true at about uh, 40 to 45 degrees and that's with some pretty crappy sails these are the <laughs> no square top main and uh, a blade a self-tacking blade that's pretty uh, crappily cut so not not too shabby eight, eight, <laughs> six, eight, four. Okay, so we fell off to about 60 degrees with the uh, same sail combo and eased the sails a bit. 7.7 .7 to 8 knots. So we've got a true wind speed of 15.5, a parent of 17, and we're we're cooking at what? 8.6? Between 7.7 7 and 8.3. Okay. Depending on the swell. 
There's an 8.45. <laughs> Self in a hurricane. 